Hayworth uh, is here at the Peabody Public Library on uh, November the 5th, uh, 2009 for the uh, Oral History Project of Worthing County. And I am John Pontius. Thank you for coming, Dick. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? I was raised in Hamilton County, Indiana. That's uh, Noblesville is the county seat, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. my hometown is Cicero. That's Cicero, Indiana, not Cicero, Illinois. Okay. <laughs> and uh, why and when did you uh, come to Worthley County? I, I came to Whitley County twice. Uh, I was employed as the assistant county agent uh, starting in February of 1946. And uh, then, uh, and I was here 16 months uh, working with B.V. Whitney as the county agent. And a man that I admired and appreciated uh, the training that he provided me to get me established as an extension agent. Okay. And uh, then I went to Angola and was there for seven years in Steuben County, down to Martinsville for ten years in Morgan County, and then they invited me to come back to Whitley County as county agent in 1964. And did you succeed uh, B.B. Whitney? No, uh, there were two men in between him and me. Okay. Uh, but, um, one, and I replaced uh, Herbie Kellogg. Uh, his health was uh, deteriorating, and so uh, he needed uh, less of a responsible uh, position. And so he was our farm, farm management agent, working from uh, uh, from Bluffton as his headquarters. But he had Whitley County, and uh, so I got to work with him, and I took his place then here in Whitley County. Uh, who else uh, was there in your office working? Uh, at that time, um, uh, we had... Um, was there a, a woman's leader? Uh, no. See, uh, that that came, well, it, uh, as county agent, yes, uh, Margaret Rosentrader was already here when I came okay. in 64. But there was no home economist uh, when I came in 46. Okay. Uh, where was your office at that time? In the post office of the uh, of Columbia City, down in the basement. Basement? Right. And uh, did... And then we moved, while I was county agent, we moved over to the old REMC building, mm -hmm. where it is now located. Mm -hmm. The office has been there since then. Mm -hmm. And um, what did you do as county agent? Well, <clears throat> the extension program is uh, a cooperative program, and that is part of the name, Cooperative Extension Service. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it entails, uh, at that time, when it was first formed, federal, state, and county. And that's the reason the word cooperative is in there. All three levels of government are represented uh, uh, were then. Today, the federal monies uh, are almost uh, non-existent as far as county positions are concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, primarily um, county and state funds that uh, pay for that. And um, anyway, um, uh, we uh, were, um, were hired by Purdue University, and actually they were our employer. Uh, there was a, an extension board in the county that was conferred with whenever an appointment was made. Uh, to uh, see that everyone is satisfied with the appointee mm -hmm. for that position. And uh, you, uh, among other things, advised farmers on uh, uh, farming our, practice? Our, our, um, our uh, responsibility, uh, in my case, as the agricultural agent, uh, and they call them educators now, agricultural educators, uh, <clears throat> is to um, assist uh, farmers in uh, the county with problems that they may have and uh, recommendations uh, are uh, forward from Purdue University through the local staff to the local people. Mm -hmm. And so we were uh, the local representative to see that research from Purdue University and other universities mm -hmm. uh, was uh, filtered down to the uh, county level so that the farmer 
who needed the information uh, had it available. And uh, in case uh, it was a real serious problem, bring a specialist from Purdue to come out and help uh, that farmer with his problem. And then uh, during my time in Extension, we uh, have had uh, educational meetings uh, out in the county. Now those are generally done from Purdue University by uh, electronic uh, uh, equipment, uh, technical equipment that I don't understand uh, that uh, provides uh, uh, access uh, to the for the local farmer and he might he or she might come into a central area like Fort Wayne or even in Columbia City and uh, meet with other farmers and they would get it by uh, uh, TV uh, mm -hmm. remote now how did you do it before you went out into uh, the townships uh, uh, we would do most of it through uh, a central meeting, say here in Columbia City, okay. we would have a, a crop specialist come to talk about uh, uh, problems with corn, we'll say as an example. And <clears throat> we would announce that, make it available, uh, notify uh, farmers uh, that uh, this person will be here on a certain day and place mm -hmm. uh, to discuss uh, the situation. What were uh, some of the major problems with for farmers uh, back when you were starting out? Well, of course, uh, uh, you're always uh, faced with uh, uh, insect and disease problems in crops and, and, and fruits as well. And uh, so uh, many times they were topics related to whatever the subject was. And we have a local committee. At that time, we'd have local committees, say a beef committee. And mm -hmm. if they had a problem that they would like to have a specialist uh, talk about, then we would notify the specialist annual, at our annual conference that we want a specialist to come out and talk about whatever the subject was to be. And uh, so that is the system that was used then. It, it's entirely different today. I suppose some farmers would come to these regularly and some a lot of people a lot of farmers wouldn't that's right uh, you you saw uh, if it was a crops uh, topic you would almost always see certain farmers come uh, mm -hmm. others uh, received their information through the uh, uh, various companies that sold the seed for okay. that crop or, uh, and uh, so it was handled both ways and then others uh, did it their own way Farmers were uh, independent. They're, they're an independent group, and, uh, uh, and yet uh, generally are well informed. They read a lot and, and keep up that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ran into uh, one farmer in um, Stubain County uh, who was still using uh, the old uh, open pollinated corn. Mm -hmm. Even though a hybrid corn had been around for a long time, he was still raising uh, the old fashioned uh, open pollinated corn. Varieties. And uh, you could save seeds with that, I suppose. You could with that, but not with, with uh, the hybrids. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you were also involved in um, more or less community organizing with, uh, uh, with the uh, Farm Bureau and the 4-H? We, we would appear uh, one month uh, each year with the Farm Bureau locally. B.B. Whitney started that. And uh, uh, we would have a topic that we would use in all the township meetings. And uh, when I came, they were getting to the point where they wanted to consolidate a little of that. And so they grouped three townships together. And I, I didn't have to attend uh, nine townships. Mm -hmm. uh, I attended uh, the three. And then eventually it became all county meetings. Okay. And, uh, but we, we annually we did uh, appear before the Farm Bureau. But we had a, a lot of public meetings uh, on community problems. And, like, like such as what? Well, uh, we, uh, uh, later in my career uh, in Whitley County, I became a community development agent uh, part, in part. And eventually I was assigned to all nine counties in this northeast area. And I was no longer an agent in Whitley County. I was, I was an area agent serving them in community development problems. 
and we set up committees in the counties uh, to uh, help them determine, and in our case, I'll use Whitley, uh, we had uh, two major things that happened. One was that EMS was established in Whitley County as a result of our meetings. Uh, we held a meetings, brought in uh, people from other counties where an EMS already existed, and, um, uh, and they told their story of how they handled uh, the emergency uh, system. And, uh, and then the county commissioners were given a report of the results of what we learned uh, through this com local uh, community development committee uh, and uh, passed that on to them and they made their own decision then as to what to do. Another one was rural house numbering. We, the fact that we each have a, a rural number just like you do in town mm -hmm. for your address that came from uh, about this, what years were, was uh, this? Well, it would be around uh, 1972, uh, three, something okay. in there. I, I don't remember exactly when those were done, but those are two major things that came out of that. And and, uh, and the, we did this in other counties too. Mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, none of them except Allen County had a uh, rural house number and, and so all of the counties d uh, developed theirs as a result of our meeting. We, we took 40 people down to Marion, Indiana to learn about uh, their EM, uh, their house, rural house numbering program. And, well, uh, well and now, uh, were these 40 people uh, just volunteers? Oh yes, they uh, were that, volunteers uh, from the various townships, or various counties I should say, who mm -hmm. w wanted to know how that system would work uh, and uh, and uh, at, in Grant County at Marion, they had uh, only used three numbers to uh, to take care of a mile, and uh, they found out that after they started putting it together, they should use four numbers. So we gained by their experience, and uh, and they told us all about how uh, they wish they had only used or they had used four instead of three. Um. What uh, what other organizations uh, in, were there uh, in the 60s and 70s? Uh, well, uh, those are the main ones that uh, we created, uh, you might say. Uh, Did you, uh, were there any problems in uh, creating yes, the numbers? Uh, not to my knowledge. It, okay. uh, the biggest problem was that uh, it was assigned to a person who didn't do anything about it for about seven years in Whitley County and finally the commissioners took it away from that person and gave it to uh, one of the out of the engineering department uh, in the county courthouse and he got it done in 15 months. Mm -hmm. That's all it took uh, to get it uh, in full bloom. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, but uh, we, we worked with other groups uh, if they needed uh, assistance of any kind why we were available. But uh, uh, this study committee, uh, community development study committee, uh, spent uh, every month they met and discussed uh, uh, what was the next thing to do. And uh, they, uh, they uh, identified several problems and passed those on without really uh, maybe uh, doing too much. Our committee, our community development committee, was not an action committee. It was more of a study group. And so their, their purpose was to turn the uh, ideas and information that they accumulated uh, um, using uh, rural house numbering as an indicator. Um, they, pass, uh, they would uh, give the information to the commissioners and let them okay. make the decision of what to do. There were more farmers back then, weren't there? Oh yes, you, know, you, can, you can count the number of farmers in Whitley County on, on two hands almost that are full-time farmers. Uh, the, the rest are working somewhere else in order to have an income. Now, what happened that uh, there are fewer farmers? Well, uh, primarily it's uh, just the advancement of uh, technology uh, mm -hmm. for farming, uh, the, uh, the economy, uh, has uh, created uh, the need for more of the same. In other words, you got to have more acres in order to make an income than you did, say, in 1960. Uh, and so as a result, uh, 
a lot of people had to get out of farming or it's a part-time thing with them. They, just, they just couldn't make uh, They couldn't make a go of it because you just, you have, it's just like in uh, business like we uh, see up and down the streets in our towns. They've got to almost double or triple their output in order to survive. And that's to compete, to compete with the larger that's farms, right. I suppose. And, uh, and anyway, today uh, uh, it's become very commercial as far as the farm is concerned. There's, uh, and, uh, and it's not uh, just a, a way of life, it's, it's a business. It has to be. It's more like a business. Oh, it has to be a business, and, and you have and to look at it that way. They, they raise fewer than crops now. Oh, oh yes, uh, uh, they generally concentrate, uh, at least in our part of the country, they uh, concentrate mostly on corn and soybeans, okay. as far as grain is concerned. Uh, some wheat, but not very much. And does that have something to do with subsidies for those crops, do you suppose? Oh, or? it may have somewhere along the way, but uh, right now uh, most of the farmers uh, don't depend on subsidies uh, uh, for uh, their operation. It has to be uh, cash and carry, so to speak. Uh, what, what happened to the the livestock? The, the livestock numbers uh, have become more concentrated in individual facilities, uh, and they're more uh, in uh, confinement. Uh, and so, again, it takes lots of them, and it takes uh, facilities uh, it costs money okay. to build uh, in order to handle them and uh, and more equipment uh, mm -hmm. and they have to be on the, on the ball as far as they, uh, a farmer is not just a farmer he is a, and he isn't just a generalist either he has to be a specialist in uh, crops and in all aspects of it uh, disease um, insect well, they had to be that way a long time ago. Oh, yeah, they did, but they they uh, they could uh, get along without uh, making so many mistakes and, and still survive. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, you make many mistakes and you're out of business. And so, uh, and the economy, of course, has its effect, just like it always has, but uh, it takes uh, it takes some skill to be a farmer. And uh, so, uh, Anyone who thinks that uh, their bumpkins uh, uh, have missed the boat completely about what a farmer is all about. So uh, culturally, farmers, uh, you know, there's not as much of a gap, is there now, than there were there was back uh, 50 years ago. Where the, the city people and the farmers, you could maybe tell which was which, but well, maybe some in some cases that's yeah. true. But today, uh, the farmer is just as much a businessman as the guy down on the street here in town. And, uh, and, is, uh, and maybe is uh, prepared educationally more than the businessman in town because there are so many aspects that he has to pull together to make that operation work. And uh, the technology and that's part right, the of technology, it, too. The, He's, he has to be a chemist, he has to be a, an entomologist, he has to be uh, um, any and every kind of uh, a person uh, to deal with crops and animals, uh, and it's, it's, it's a full-time job. And I suppose that uh, the farmers now don't get together with each other as much uh, as they <clears throat> used to. Uh, farm organizations are, uh, it's more difficult to get them uh, involved because they can get their information in so okay. many different sources, and uh, uh, and they're still pretty independent, uh, like they've always been. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, uh, they get themselves educated pretty well uh, on their own. And uh, I mean, they they depend on others to to educate them, uh, especially uh, companies that uh, produce the product that they need uh, in order to operate. Uh, is one source, the extension service is another, the banks are, uh, and the people who loan them the money are specialists to help them in that aspect. So they've, they've got to be prepared in so many ways. So, so that means uh, the extension service operates differently now than oh, when yes. you ran it, oh, right? Yes. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, 
We don't have, uh, they don't have the meetings out in the counties like we used to have. Uh, they uh, utilize, they can get more of that information uh, through the universities directly uh, and, uh, and from the various companies that supply them with uh, seed, fertilizer, and so forth. And so uh, there are many more sources for them. And, and even uh, the television uh, is a source. And uh, so all of these uh, make up uh, a rather complex group that they can turn to. Now, uh, when you first started at, at the Extension Service, um, uh, the small farmers could make a decent living? Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they, uh, uh, they still needed to have a certain uh, number of acres, uh, in, in the, at least in this part of the country, where it's yes. corn and beans and wheat and oats and all that. Uh, they had to have a fair number of acres, and the, the small farmer still had struggled uh, okay. in many cases. But uh, if they had uh, 200 acres of corn when I was a boy, uh, I mean, 200 acres farm, they were in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, a 2,000 is uh, more common. Uh, was farming um, much different in the flatlands of Jefferson and Washington Township as opposed to the hills of Richland Township in, and Thorn Creek? In some cases, uh, that would be true, to, and to some extent is, it is true, but uh, still, with the technology and the information we have, we can pretty well produce on a rolling uh, field of uh, land about as well as you can on flat land. Uh, it's much uh, easier to do that today with technology that we have. But I, I do recall, uh, and this was after I just come to this county uh, the, the first time, I was, uh, I had my father-in-law up here visiting from Boone County. That's all flat, black land, very productive. <clears throat> and we were driving down up over a slope and there was a cornfield and I said, that corn will make a hundred bushel of this. He, he couldn't uh, comprehend uh, that rolling field. Uh, mm -hmm. that probably uh, had a lot of uh, erosion on it too because the rows were planted right up the hill. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't make that, but they, they could uh, and did. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's, it's somewhat a misnomer, but uh, it's true that uh, we can get 200 bushels of corn down in Jefferson and uh, Worston Township much easier than we could ever in the rolling land now, even now. Uh, I remember my grandfather uh, started uh, farm, Purdue Farm record books yes. back in about 1929. And were many farmers doing that? No, each county uh, there would be, oh, depending on the size of the county and the amount of agriculture. Uh, the uh, farm management department at Purdue uh, were the people who uh, conducted this. And they generally had about 15 to 20 farmers from a county. And okay. uh, I remember those, uh, they don't have that anymore, but uh, oh. uh, uh, there were about 15 uh, different farmers, and I think uh, your dad was maybe one of them, if I recall that. And um, they, uh, they used uh, the uh, book that Purdue put out uh, as their uh, book to keep the records in and so forth. And keep there was records. a specialist would come out and visit with them during the year and uh, if they had, uh, so this was kind of a special group and so they received uh, probably a lot more attention uh, personally than the average farmer in the county because of record keeping. And if they had a problem that the economist who came out and worked with them uh, on a regular basis uh, couldn't deal with, he could go uh, suggest they get a hold of uh, Whoever at the university, if it was a if it was a big problem, get a hold of one of the specialists and they could help. Now, someone from Purdue would, would come up. Oh well, yes, they, up they, I, uh, I took a different specialists out for individual farm help uh, many times, and uh, so it, those people were available 
uh, both on an, on an individual basis as well as on a group basis. Uh, and you could even uh, send the farmer down to see them at Purdue if you need to, uh, if it was going to be a, a problem to get, uh, or if they wanted to see uh, uh, some uh, material or whatever that was at Purdue but not available out here. So uh, that was done, yes. And um, they would uh, really get some really good, uh, good um, advice and information oh, yes. on how to improve that's right. And if their crops weren't doing as well, and uh... sure, uh, we had uh, you know just like uh, uh, <clears throat> some years we had uh, corn borer problems. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, now corn borer is not nearly as much of a problem anymore because they have uh, even uh, uh, bred the uh, corn uh, to a point where it's a little resistant to it, and, and, and then there's chemicals to use to control it otherwise anyway. So uh, all of those things have changed just because of technology. Do you remember uh, some uh, farmers that were particularly good and uh, had a larger farm or? Uh... Oh yes, uh, uh, s size had its, its benefits, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time you had to be a good manager or it, it wasn't gonna be. Uh, and uh, some failed, uh, they, they, they got too uh, aggressive. Too big. Uh, and uh, maybe they bought too much farm machinery or couldn't resist the idea of always having it new. And uh, Was there a particularly uh, bad time? Uh, in the... Oh yes, our economy is just like we're at, at this time in 2009, we're in a low, low economy. Mm -hmm. And we've had those at different times. And uh, I grew up in the Depression which was a whopper of a depression. And uh, so- On a farm? On a farm, oh okay. yes, I'm a farm boy. And that's where I live now is on a farm. So I'm, I'm like the old cotton-tailed rabbit. I, I went in a circle <laughs> and I'm back where I started from, so to speak. Um, now the, um, uh, the, uh, the large farmer always had a little bit of an advantage uh, as long as he knew how to deal with it, mm -hmm. and, and he could uh, uh, have a pretty good life uh, accordingly. But he, he, was, he had to be a good manager even then, uh, when some, uh, it was more a way of life rather than, than a business. I suppose some farmers uh, kept on farming even though they weren't making much money, but oh, yeah, they, so they loved the life. Uh, and, and you know, in some of our economic uh, slowdowns, uh, they were living off of the uh, uh, the uh, depreciation and uh, really going backwards. Mm -hmm. and, and many found themselves having to go find a factory job because they, they that uh, overcame them. Were there more farmers uh, working in a factory uh, at a particular time, like later or? Oh, I'd say uh, if, uh, I don't know now because uh, most of them have had to quit farming and so uh, we're only down to a small number, okay. uh, even part-time, uh, because uh, so many of the acreage uh, that uh, widow ladies have, uh, have and they let it out for rent, uh, it's picked up by these larger farmers to the point that there aren't many farmers, period. And, uh, and that's uh, uh, just because of technology and uh, the economy and the whole uh, bad matter of operating a farm, uh, uh, we have lost that, uh, that group yeah. of people to the factory and uh, they don't even farm. Well, I, I uh, notice in uh, obituaries, even uh, now, where uh, many farmers uh, worked uh, 30 years or so in factories oh, sure. too. And, oh yes, uh, well, we, have, uh, we have some farmers that I know that um, uh, worked and, and still farmed a lot of land. Uh, how did they do I, that? Uh, well, their it was a family operation okay. and uh, their sons uh, helped out. But I, I know of, uh, one particular farmer in this county that just spent uh, a good many years in a uh, factory, oh I know several. 
uh, and um, and yet they have uh, had fairly sizable operations anyway. They, but, but they knew how to uh, utilize their farm machinery to the greatest uh, benefit to them, and uh, and they understood uh, farming well enough to be efficient. I suppose if they didn't have much livestock uh, and they were mostly and, grain and farmers, that, would... that sometimes was an advantage. Yes. Okay. But I, this one I'm thinking I've still raised uh, uh, quite a few beef cattle. Okay. Yeah, fed them. Yeah. Do you um, recall uh, any um, leaders in the farm community that you would like to mention? Oh, I, I don't know. There's uh, so many. Uh, uh, one who is still on the farm, uh, but he's pretty much uh, turned it over to his son. Uh, is Harold Myers. I consider him one of the uh, strong farmers of the county. Where and is he? He's out uh, on your way to South Whitley, on, right on 205, and he, but in Columbia Township. Uh, uh, there's too there's too many out there to name, so I'll I'll quit with him. But uh, uh, he he is uh, has done well and and not tried to get beyond was reasonable to be able to handle it. Now, do you remember um, many farms where there were like that, where a son took over and maybe then an, uh, the, the son of the son? Oh yes, there's, there's some of those uh, scattered throughout the county. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, um, uh, uh, there's what, they're, uh, they're the ones who are holding the, the agriculture business uh, in good stead uh, because they've, um, They've learned from their dads and their grandfathers uh, how to do it right, and uh, as a result, they and grew up with it. So it was in their blood, and uh, they've been able to maintain it. But it's more difficult, and they, they're living with the banker. Uh, whoever helps finance them to operate uh, have to be uh, a team, or it won't work. And uh, that's true of all farmers, but uh, that's the only way these young fellows have a chance uh, to make it. Okay. Back in uh, 60 and 70, or maybe even before, um, where did farmers uh, sell their grain and their livestock here? Well, of course, we had our local grain elevators, uh, and that's where uh, a good share of it. Uh, there's is more than still. one round. Oh, yeah, there's a few, and uh, not many like it used to be, but there again, they were too small and, and didn't expand uh, as uh, farming became uh, more uh, uh, more aggressive. Now let's see, there were an elevator in Peabody, That's south of town. Some, right. And mm -hmm. one, was there one in Raber? There's another one in Raber and there's still uh, operations in both of those, but they're owned oh. by the same people. Same company owns both of those plus okay. many more. Uh, but they used to be Probably in um, South Whitley. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the headquarters of, of one of the companies. And, uh, of course, there was uh, two operations in Columbia City uh, for many years and still... Uh, now, where, was, where were those two in Columbia Well, City? the one was the Columbia Grain. And where was that? That's uh, out over on the east side of Columbia City. Okay. Uh, and then the other one was uh, Farmer's Grain and Feed. Uh, down uh, in the southwest part of town. Mm -hmm. Those uh, were the two main elevators. Uh, then um, uh, there's, there were a few operations out in the county, uh, larger uh, farm operations and more grain facilities, but not many. Uh, in some counties, you would find that true more than you did in Whitley. Most, uh, most of it was handled by these grain elevators. But they also, had people who bought uh, on a large scale and, and uh, or the farmer sold to a large operation outside the county and uh, that was also uh, uh, part of the uh, whole system of uh, marketing. What happened to the Farm Bureau Co-op? Well, the Farm Bureau Co-op, uh, I think uh, it, it was uh, uh, I don't know the background of it all together, but... Uh, uh, they used to have like an implement dealership and well, an elevator that, well, and... Uh, yeah, they did, uh, some would have 
more uh, of the uh, equipment, not too much in this county that had farm machinery. They were mostly just handling fertilizer and seeds. Uh, that would be uh, their main um, program. But uh, It used to be on Market Street there across from the courthouse. Uh, uh, the, uh, I remember that. Well, uh, uh, that's, where Heinen's uh, yeah. are now. Well, I, uh, that's before my time. Okay. That's, that's before me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, the Farm Bureau owned, uh, had a um, uh, gasoline station and a store uh, there. So that was Farm Bureau Co-op there. And I, uh, that uh, finally closed because uh, uh, it, it just uh, wasn't getting enough business to justify it. But the Farm Bureau Co-op, on the state basis uh, throughout the state, uh, ended up selling to uh, uh, another operation, and then uh, they closed many of the, or sold off of the equipment. The one at, uh, at um, Cherubusco was a uh, was a part of another organization, and they, uh, the co-op, uh, had it for a while, and then they sold out to a private company and, and it's now part of the uh, uh, system of elevators that are here in the county, mm -hmm. A plus. It's uh, it evolved it's, from the co-ops. Yeah, right. and, and the co-ops no, no longer exist. And they, now the co-ops were uh, made up of the farmers themselves? The farmers had uh, ownership uh, in it. Uh, and stock? Stock, right. And uh, uh, they I, th I don't know the, uh, much of the detail of it, but I know that uh, you, uh, if you bought there, after a while you earned a, a, a stock, a, a, the value of a stock, okay. and they would issue that to you. And uh, so as a patron of the co-op, you had an opportunity to get some ownership, so to speak, in it. And uh, I own some of that, uh, but uh, I think it ended up that it wasn't worth anything when mm -hmm. they sold out. They did that for economic reasons, they thought. Uh, they did, and, and it worked for, uh, in years past better than it does today. Uh, mm -hmm. There may be co-ops uh, scattered out in uh, larger farming areas. I don't uh, know. I haven't followed that. But uh, I think for the most part the co-op system has gone by the wayside. That was another way farmers got together. That's right, yes, and, it is. Um, right. Uh, now, the Farm Bureau was two different groups. There was one that was the educational uh, group, uh, primarily, and uh, they also uh, saw to it to uh, get legislation that would benefit the farmer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then uh, the other group was the co-op then. But they, those were two independent groups. Now, did the women of the county, uh, in connection with maybe Farm Bureau, have an organization? The women had their own, uh, well, early in the early days of this county, it was with the Farm Bureau, but then uh, uh, later it was, uh, the two were separated and the HOMEC uh, organization within Extension had its own board of directors and on a county level, and then they had their local groups uh, to, and this was uh, primarily uh, to uh, help the, the ladies uh, the homemakers uh, with uh, their um, educational needs and uh, at the same About time... About cooking and, and... Right, and uh, homemaking and all of that. And uh, at the same time, uh, they did get involved with legislation too, the same as the men did, uh, to uh, help the, far and the family farm. Mm -hmm. so, they would meet regularly then? Oh yes, monthly they met. And, uh, but the, uh, and there still are home ec clubs that are run by the Extension Service, uh, but uh, it's pre uh, predominantly now, I think, of the older ladies and uh, not too many of the young uh, ladies uh, mm -hmm. participate. And so it's kind of lost in, in membership. Okay. Uh, Margaret Rosenstreet. Rosenstreeter. Yeah. Uh, she was the county leader? Of she that? was, yeah, well, she was the uh, specialist there, the, uh, staff member in the Extension Office. Uh, that's part of Purdue again. And they had their specialist at the university who would come out and uh, make presentations on homemaking and uh, all the various subjects of that. And uh, <clears throat> would uh, 
uh, again, uh, try to uh, promote things locally that would be educational for any and all women. And, uh, so she was a long time yeah, she person was, there. She was a teacher, a home ec teacher primarily, mm -hmm. and then was hired as the first home economist uh, or mm -hmm. home demonstration agent, they called him then, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, serve in Whitley County. Mm -hmm. And uh, ever since, there has been a home economist in the office. But when I came here in uh, 1946, there was no home economist. And she was from uh, Cherry Busco area? Uh, that was where she was raised, yeah. And, and she had two brothers that uh, were farmers up uh, near Cherry Busco. And very successful farmers. Yes, right, I they think. were. And they were very, they were very strong uh, extension cooperators, too. Uh, there, was, um, there was a special um, uh, soil uh, uh, management type program that uh, they, the two boys uh, participated in and there were specialists from Purdue that uh, coordinated all that for all of Indiana and I know uh, I was around when they came out and Mr. Whitney made sure that I was involved so I would know about it. But they, uh, that pretty much uh, went to the wayside because farmers in general were beginning to uh, adopt these kind of uh, practices. One was uh, contour farming, which uh, doesn't lend itself quite so well in, in this part of the country like it does out in Iowa and some of those states with long slopes. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were many things and even um, minimum tillage uh, was developed as a part of that whole program. Mm -hmm. Now, are there still Rosen traders, Rosen traders there farming? Yes, I think a, a, a nephew of her, a Marcus, okay. uh, has uh, still farms up there on the farm where his dad uh, farmed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the 4-H and 4-H uh, fair. Was the 4-H fair in Whitley County different than um, other counties? Oh there? yes, uh, it has always been a volunteer fair run by volunteers and uh, uh, they have uh, been very uh, protective of the idea that it be a free fair. Uh, this is uh, going they, way back. Oh yes, they never charged uh, for you to attend the fair, where a lot of fairs now do. Uh, and uh, so uh, they, uh, they insist that it not have a carnival of any type, and so that it, it's there for the benefit of the children who are 4-H members. And so they are the ones who are highlighted, not uh, not anybody else. And uh, so any any income that's made, like serving food or that type of thing, refreshments, uh, is handled by the fair board itself and volunteers that help. And so uh, they don't, uh, and even the rental of the buildings uh, in the off periods of the year, uh, that all goes for the operation of the fair. Are, is 4-H uh, different now than it was in 1960, like the number, the kind of projects? Yes, the projects, uh, during the time that I was agent here, which was from 64 to 79, uh, the uh, mini 4-H was developed. That was for the kids less than nine years of age. From about nine to, uh, well, eight, I'll say eight to ten. Uh, it was an introduction type program to get uh, children thinking in terms of projects and uh, and being a part of 4-H. And uh, they didn't get into business meetings like the older 4-Hers, the junior leaders, but they would uh, uh, have crafts uh, that they could show that were uh, some showing skill somewhat, but uh, the main thing was that they had a project that they could participate in and feel that they were a part of 4-H, even though they were too young. And bring to the fair. And they bring they? it to the fair and uh, display it 
and they got and they always got a blue ribbon, the the, the young ones. Uh, the, the, after they were in this, that's this fair. Now uh, other fairs handled uh, ribbons entirely different, but uh, <clears throat> uh, and the older children generally it was uh, blue, red, and, and white. Mm -hmm. But uh, that wasn't true for the, the young ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, back. Uh, in, in the 60s, um, there were probably not as many town people in 4-H as now. No, generally it was more difficult to get a town club established. Okay. Uh, we did have some, but uh, in this county it didn't uh, work too well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure today uh, where the clubs are, or mm -hmm. where their, their centers are. I am not familiar with that. But uh, they have more children. There's uh, over a thousand children in 4-H here now. And when I was agent, uh, we couldn't seem to get it beyond about 750 or 800. It was uh, more difficult. But uh, here again, there's a lot more that are in many 4-H today than we ever had. I remember seeing you uh, at the 4-H fair watching the dairy judging. Uh, what happened to all the dairy farms in the county? Uh, again, size. Uh, if you didn't, if you don't have uh, 300 cows, it can't hardly be in the business. Uh, okay. it, it's all the milk is picked up in a big bulk tank, and uh, it used to be a, a truck with a whole cans. Mm -hmm. That's so inefficient uh, in this day and age that it wouldn't work. That's just one part of it. Uh, another part is facilities. It, uh, you've got to have um, a system that keeps uh, for a matter of cleanliness to keep the milk uh, pure and uh, so it takes a much uh, cleaner equipment and you have to be maintaining all of that uh, just like a housewife has to be sure to serve her family uh, good uh, clean food you had to, that had to be that way too and with the milk. Uh, another part is uh, just numbers of animals uh, to make a living. So you have to be large in comparison to the, the eight cows that I helped milk when I was a kid at home. Now, did the, the milkman pick up these cans every day? Yes, uh, well, uh, I think they, they have co co tanks with cooling equipment okay. and it's installed in them uh, and so they can hold it a little longer, but I don't know the, the frequency today. Probably I, within every it, day or so. It has to almost be every day anyway because the, the, uh, it's a perishable product so you've got to be moving it all the time and, uh, and so it has to be uh, almost a daily thing. Uh, we have Amish farmers here in the county, uh, I guess in Cleveland Township? Right, right. When did they come? They came just before, uh, about the time I retired. Mm -hmm. I, I helped uh, two farmers, uh, two of uh, the Amish brothers uh, <clears throat> that had moved, had bought a farm that had uh, uh, stall, uh, tie stalls in the um, uh, and they needed to get it into a tramp shed system, and they were wanting some advice before, and that was the very week I retired. And so I never got to follow through on what they did. So I don't know today uh, what the, the outcome was, but uh, I know they called, uh, came in to see me for help. And it just happened that that was near my uh, end of extension. How uh, were the Amish able to make it without tractors and combines and electricity? Well, uh, again, I think volume, they've increased the size of their units uh, in order to keep up. Uh, but they um, uh, they have large families. So the, family, that, the families that, help. That makes a difference. The labor uh, that it takes on any farm uh, is absorbed by that a family of many compared to the size of a, of a, a so-called English uh, farmer's family. Mm -hmm. Probably he's the only one. 
that is uh, really uh, doing the farm work and he may hire somebody else to work with him where they have uh, several people that they can and they I think they work as teams of families helping each other okay. as well and so uh, they're uh, uh, kind of a closed community and so as a result they help each other and they, uh, they that makes up there, there's more physical work uh, with the yeah. Amish. And, and they're still using uh, facility and equipment that uh, is manual in use, where uh, the average adult, a farmer today is working with uh, a very sophisticated piece of machinery, and it's got to be large and pull a lot of uh, uh, equipment. So they are farming like most people farmed a hundred years ago, that's aren't they? That's right. Uh, there are some things I'm, I'm sure they are able to take advantage of that we didn't have then. Better uh, seed, yes. pro seed uh, varieties, uh, chemicals and uh, products to control uh, the uh, so-called enemies of, uh, of crops. And uh, so it's, uh, it's just a different ball game for them. But they are able to uh, farm now. Um, are, do you believe that the soil is better taken care of by the Amish than? Uh, <coughs> oh, I, I would say it's. Um, I don't know that that's that much different. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they respect the farm and the soil right, on the mm -hmm. farm. Uh, they do, and, and I think most of farmers do today. Uh, we don't hear about mining uh, cropland like we did years ago where someone rents a farm and then just uh, wears it out uh, without putting much back into it to, uh, to get good results. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, you don't hear that mentioned and I don't think the Amish, uh, they look at that as a, as a, um, uh, a gift to them and they want to take care of it. So I don't think there's that much difference between uh, an Amish farmer and the others uh, in terms of attitude. Well, have there been any um, unusual uh, experiences uh, over the years that you had with uh, the community or with the farmers? Uh, well, one of the things that I think I um, uh, has developed in my uh, career uh, <clears throat> I worked for 32 years as an agent. Uh, <clears throat> when I um, uh, got to Stavin County, there were two foresters in the area, one uh, from the Department of Natural Resources in the Division of Forestry, serving uh, several counties up here. And then we had an extension forester who was stationed uh, either in, uh, uh, I think it was in Noble County or, or uh, Auburn, I'm not sure which now, um, and uh, the, um, and they uh, served, uh, and, wh and one was stationed in Whitley County for a while, um, they served the same area too, uh, of about, uh, we had nine counties, I think, in our uh, district. I think the, the DNR, uh, DNR uh, man had more counties than that, but, um, Anyway, I got acquainted with both of them, and uh, they were a uh, great help to me. And uh, we we developed uh, a forestry program as a part, so we could take care of our woodlands and get uh, better uh, production from them and less lo uh, less waste, uh, just uh, because it was there and, and uh, wasn't doing anything. Uh, it was not true. It really it was a productive uh, unit. Uh, but it needed some maintenance and management. Were there more woods? Oh yes, uh, like in the oh, 60s. And oh yeah, there's been a lot of them uh, plowed out or you know thrown, clear, okay. cleared off and uh, farmed now. But um, uh, the attitude then uh, was that they they were kind of uh, a nuisance rather than a benefit, and they turned livestock in on them, and, and as a result, really ruined them. Uh, and then the other end of it was that I was getting stories uh, about uh, widow ladies being taken advantage of by buyers of uh, timber 
uh, coming in and, and uh, saying, I'll, I'll give you $500 or whatever the figure was uh, for so many logs, uh, which was way low as far as the value was concerned. And we, I felt that we needed to do some educational work for people in general. So uh, we started that. I had a forestry committee in every county that I served, which was uh, not true in most counties. Uh, and as a result, um, I work now as a volunteer in retirement. Uh, I worked to help develop the tree board in Columbia City and was on it seven years. And I am helping the library develop an educational uh, program on uh, native trees of Indiana. We have 40 trees that are all native species out at the library grounds, and uh, we're ready to put signs up to tell people what they, what they are. And, uh, Do you think there are more trees in Columbia City along the streets, or there were more 50 years ago maybe than now? Uh, well, this, uh, this is some of the history we learned. About 1906 or 5, somewhere in there, there were 3,500 salt maples planted. Uh, salt maple trees planted along, in Columbia City. Along the streets. Along the streets. And we're still trying to get rid of some of them. Uh, the, uh, the, um, because the this, branches fall. That's and right. And uh, they're subject to uh, storms and everything. Okay. And uh, they're rotting away now. And every year the city takes about 40 trees out. And uh, so we, we're catching up with that. We don't plant soft maple anymore. And I, I'm not on the board anymore. But we didn't plant anymore after I, while I was on. And uh, I don't think they do now. Okay. Well, uh, Dick, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge of Whitley County for the generations to come. Well, I hope it was of some help to understand some of the history of the Extension Service and, and Whitley County Agriculture. Good. Thank you very thank much. You.